Um, before we start up with the actual lecture, keep in mind that the first exam is next Friday. Um, you can bring a calculator and pens, pencils, erasers, all that good stuff. Um, there's not going to be any MATLAB code on this exam. You don't have to write any MATLAB code for this exam because we haven't gotten into the coupled ODEs that we have to solve for um, the energy balance. The next homework that you have, homework uh, three, um, is going to be almost all differential equations that have to be solved on MATLAB, which is why we will then have MATLAB on exams. Um, you can also have one page of handwritten notes um, front and back. You can put more or less anything you want on there as long as you write it by hand. Um, don't type it out and take the book and put it on there. Um, regarding homework, everything that we covered up until now should have been um, enough to solve all except 2.5 and 2.6. And you even could have tried to attempt to solve 2.5 and 2.6. You just would have introduced a small error if you weren't using this particular equation, um, which is what we will get into now. Um, before I get moving on the small correction factor we need, are there any questions about the class up till now or any questions about the material from last lecture or last week or the week before that? Sure. Are you going to tell us where you stop as far as Oh, good question. The exam covers up through homework two. Homework two? Yep. And Which is today. Today is the last bit of material that would be on the exam. And the material from today is not really new material. Um, we're just going over the material that we covered previously. Can you also, like, uh, our professor and our class, we're doing the page numbers as far as the books that are actually useful for that? So um, if you take a look at each of the lectures where I introduce something new, those little section numbers on there are what you're after. So yeah. which of the homework two problems should we even expect to be able to solve? Uh, up through Wednesday, you could have solved everything except these. Okay. And you could have solved these as well with the same techniques. You just would have been slightly off. Okay. So it's not like there was a new technique we needed. We just need to correct this concentration term. All right. Yeah. Do you want a piazza for this class? I will make a piazza for the class, but I usually won't interact with it very much. Do you want one? Okay. I'm going to write myself a note. Make piazza. All right. Any other questions before we move along? OK. Um, so just as a brief recap of what we had covered over the last few days, the general idea was we needed to learn more about this KEQ. So these are the Ks. Again, all the Ks I'm going to deal with today are capital Ks for equilibrium constants. So I'm going to drop the caps as I move along. Um, I won't put the caps back on until we start talking about the different rate Ks versus equilibrium Ks. Um, and we had said we had two ways to solve this. The first was that we could calculate K0, K1, K2. Um, and these were only a function of temperature. We generally had two ways to do that. We could either use EQ calc um, if we wanted a fairly exact expression, or we could use the shortcut expression, which approximates EQ calc as just K naught K1. Right? Either one of those would work. The shortcut equation also works if I just give you a K at some temperature. Right, instead of calculating the K from the Gibbs energy of the reaction at 298, I could just give you basically a K naught at some temperature and it ask you to adjust it by using K1. It's the same process. However you calculate K naught, either I give it to you at a temperature or you calculate it at 298 using Gibbs energy, it's the same um, procedure to calculate the shortcut value of K. And then on Wednesday's class, we said this was equal to the product of all of the activity coefficients raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, activities, not activity coefficients. Um, and these, we saw, were generally a function of concentration and pressure. This term on the right, we only had three ways that we ever solve something like that, or three ways that we express those activities. There was Kc times Kct, 
What was this one for? There was a particular phase that we would only use that for? Liquid. We always had that for a liquid, and then we had two for a gas. There was either Kp, Kfi, uh, and that was for a real gas. Or we could simplify it and just say it's about Kfi if it was an ideal gas. The easiest way to figure out whether or not you need Kfi is calculate Kfi. Right? If you have the information to calculate Kfi, calculate it at the temperature and pressure you want and see if it's around 1 or not. If it's around 1, then you can get rid of it. I mean, not get rid of it. Set it exactly equal to 1 so that you don't have to worry about any of those effects. If it's more than about 1% away from 1, so like 0.99 or 1.01, uh, it might be worth including it. Certainly if it's 3 or 4% away, then dump it in there. Um, but if it's near 1, we'll get rid of it. If I say that uh, pressure effects are not important, then you would get rid of KFI. Um, or if I tell you to treat it as an ideal gas, then you can get rid of KFI. So those were the, all the different Ks that we had. And then we had introduced one more that wasn't really a new K. We had just said that um, Kp is also equal to Kc times Rt to the delta. That came from the ideal gas law that said the partial pressure of some component is equal to the concentration of that component times Rt. If you substitute that into the definition of Kp, you'll end up with this relationship here, which is not a new Kp. There's nothing new there. It just lets us move back and forth between the two. However, we do have something of a problem. Every um, system that we've done so far, we've made the following assumption, assumptions. We've said P is constant. We have also said T is constant. And most batch reactors do have a constant volume. They're a metal cylinder with a lid on top, and we just heat it up. So we have also said that V is constant. So what does this mean? If we write the ideal gas law, we would have PV is equal to NRT. If we look at the system before and after it reacts, so we write PV equals NRT for the system after it reacts, and we'll subscript it with zero for the system before it has reacted. And we take the ratio of those. We get P0, V0 is N0, R, T0. Right, you've probably seen that ratio before. That was, you know, high school chemistry stuff. But we have a bit of a problem. If P and P0 are the same, then these two will cancel if, obviously, the R's are the same. If it's isothermal, then the T's will be the same. And if it's in a batch reactor such that the volume is constant, the V's will be the same. As a result, under these assumptions, we have that N is equal to N0 which is that the moles that we started with is equal to the moles we finished with, which is not always the case. Right? We've already seen that this is not true. What it actually is is the moles we started with plus this term Na0 delta times x. Right? So something is inconsistent here. We can't simultaneously keep the pressure constant, the volume constant, and the temperature constant, and still expect some number of moles to change. For example, if we had something like A goes to B plus C, the number of moles is going to change, right? If I take one A and I break it in half, I'm going to have twice as much A when I'm all done, right, if I completely consume A. So we have a bit of a problem here. The problem is we can't keep all three of those constant all the time. There are some special cases where that happens to work. That special case is if delta happens to be zero. If delta is zero, I know it's hilarious, but maybe not quite so loud with the laughter. Thank you. Um, if delta happens to be zero and we start off with the same number of moles and we finish with the same number of moles, just by sheer coincidence, we can end up with constant pressure, constant temperature, and constant volume. But usually that doesn't happen. So we're going to have to figure out a way um, to correct one of these initial assumptions. The two that we usually keep are constant pressure and constant temperature. The constant volume one, we will allow that one to change. 
The reason we allow that to change is because in a flow reactor, we have to let it change, right? There's, there's nothing to stop the gas from expanding in the direction of flow, so we have to allow for V to change. In a batch reactor, we just have to get to, back to that weird example of a cylinder with a movable piston on the top, um, which we don't use all that often, uh, but we do actually need something like that if we're going to keep all of those um, assumptions as best we can. So how do we deal with it? Uh, we rearrange the ideal gas equation. So we just take this equation down here on the bottom and solve for V as a function of all those other parameters. So if we do that, we end up with V is equal to V0 times a bunch of ratios. So T over T naught, P naught over P, and N over N naught. And now we have an expression for n. This n is equal to n naught plus uh, na naught delta xa. So we can dump that inside of our expression. Remember, this is only for ideal gases. So we end up with v is v naught times all these ratios, p naught over p plus this new term, which is 1 plus ya naught times delta times xa. This is for, actually, we're going to use this for all gases, not just ideal gases. Where does that come in? That comes into our concentration, which we had initially said c sub i was equal to the moles of i over V. If V was constant, then we could have said C sub I is moles of I over V naught, but V is not constant, so we have this new adjusted form, which is Na naught times theta I plus nu sub I xA divided by V naught times those ratios again, so T over T naught p naught over p, uh, and 1 plus ya naught delta xa. This is a pretty important equation. In fact, you can always use this equation and get the same results um, as the previous equation that we had for ci, which only included the ca naught and the terms in the numerator. Um, but this one is the one that we should always use for gases. The reason we should always use that is because it doesn't make any assumptions about whether or not V is constant or not. It allows V to change depending on how temperature and pressure and the number of moles change. So this is the more useful form, maybe not the easier form to use because there's more stuff there, um, but it does still simplify into something that's fairly easy to use. For example, if you're at um, constant temperature and constant pressure, those first two terms in the uh, denominator, well, second and third terms in the denominator, they're going to simplify to 1 anyway. So it ends up looking very similar to what we've seen before, except with this 1 plus ya naught delta xa term in the denominator. So the reason we need something like this for the two problems that I mentioned, 2.5 and 2.6b, um, is because in those examples, delta is changing, or delta is not 0. The number of moles is changing um, from when we start the system to when we finish the system. There is an alternative um, to something like this. Remember, we always have this Kp for gases, uh, which is equal to Kc times Rt to the delta. So the reason this equation is important is because it usually goes into Kc. Right? Kc is that product of all of the concentrations raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. Um, we can skip this problem altogether if we have enough information that was given to us um, because this is also going to be equal to, I mean, Kp uh, by itself is equal to the partial pressures of everything raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, which is going to look something like y sub d over, sorry, y d, y c over y a, a, and y b, b times whatever that temperature or that pressure term ends up looking like. Each one of those y's 
is equal to the moles of I divided by the total number of moles. Right, that's another option that we can use for gases if this is a little bit easier for us because that's not going to have any temperature or pressure term sitting inside of it. It's only going to have thetas and conversions and deltas sitting inside it. So you can use either one of these. In fact, you have to get the same answer regardless of which one you choose to use because the ideal gas law says they have to be equivalent. Um, if it is easier for you to talk about how the moles are changing, so remember we practiced writing the stoichiometric table in terms of moles or in terms of conversion. If writing that table in terms of moles is easier for you, if you have enough information to do all of that, then when you're trying to solve for Kp, you can stick to just the y's instead of trying to convert those to c's. If, however, we're talking about concentrations, and maybe I don't give you um, anything but concentration, I don't give you a volume, um, and therefore you don't know the number of moles, then you can use this full version of the C up here. Um, either one of those should be equivalent. Whichever way you prefer to write it um, should give you the same answer if you keep track of everything closely. So let's see an example of this, which is going to look very similar to um, your two homework problems. So let's say we have ethane. Uh, is going to try to form acetylene, C2H2, um, and hydrogen. And we're going to say that this is at 1200K, 3 bar. Uh, and initially we have all um, ethane. So the way that I've written this, it's A goes to B plus C. 2C. Okay, so in order to solve something like this, oh, it's all gas phase too. As soon as you see a YA naught and a temperature and a pressure, that should imply that it's gas phase. Um, but just to be clear, that is a gas. Everything here is a gas. By the way, we will never encounter phase changes in this class. Um, everything is always one phase. So in order to figure out what the equilibrium conversion is um, for this particular system, we have to follow that pattern um, that we introduced at the end of last class that you're going to practice on this homework, uh, which is to solve for these two portions one at a time. The first thing that we'll do is try to figure out KEQ, and that's going to come from EQ calc. So this is step one. The next step is to figure out which of the Ks we need, which we're going to let this thing be an ideal gas because the temperature is high and the pressure is low. We're going to set that value of Keq equal to Kp, write out that full expression for Kp, uh, and then we're going to solve that equation for x. Um, it's probably going to be or, um, implicit in x, so we have to use an iterative scheme to solve for it. Um, but we will be able to eventually solve for it. And that's the same pattern that these problems always follow. Get KEQ, or the shortcut version of K first, write down whatever the appropriate version is of the activities, so KP or KC or whatever you need to use, um, and then solve for X with whichever version is easier for you, either in moles or in concentration. We're going to start this one at concentration um, just so that we can see how that new equation gets put into um, this sort of a process. And then we'll use the other version to check our answer when we're all done, because we should be able to get the same thing either way. So the first thing to do is get KEQ. And if you dump these into EQ calc, which I'm not going to pull up a computer just to put these in there, um, KEQ is 0.587. Just to be sure, we can also calculate KPhi. And K phi for this system was 1.0007, which is really close to 1. All right, so assuming that this is an ideal gas is a pretty good assumption. The K phi parameter, that doesn't really look like, that's a bad looking phi down there, is not the greatest in the world. There we go. That's a better phi. So K phi is pretty tiny. It's about 1. We're going to assume that this is an ideal gas. The next step is to set KEQ equal to KP, 
And again, we're going to solve this one first using KCs. So we need KC times RT to the delta. Which will end up looking like concentration of C, which is hydrogen squared, um, concentration of B, which is our acetylene, over the concentration of A, times RT. And now delta here is 2 plus 1 minus 1, so we're going to have 2. So we've sort of set up all of the equations. Now we just need to apply this other one, the new one, this version of C. We need to stick that into here. So it is going to look like a fairly nasty looking equation with lots of things on either side. If this is an isothermal and an isobaric system, like I said before, these two terms are going to go away. The T over T naught and the P naught over P naught, or sorry, P naught over P are going to go away. We can also take this term. This just looks like C A naught. So that's not awful. We also happen to have that Y A naught is 1, so we don't have to worry about Y A naught. So it's going to look very similar to what we had before for every one of these. For every C sub I here, for this specific example, it's going to look like C A naught times theta plus the stoichiometric coefficient times x divided by 1, what's the sign? 1, plus 2 times x. Notice that if x is really, really tiny, Right, if we don't convert very much, uh, let's say x is only 0 0.001 or something like that, 2 times 0 0.001 is still a really tiny number, which is really tiny in comparison to the 1 that's sitting next to it. So for very small conversions, we don't even have to make this correction. It's just that when we're starting out, we don't know if that conversion is large or small, so we have to carry it around with us anyway. Those are those times where you get lucky and a problem but they enforce bad habits um, by dropping stuff like that because it looks like it works once and then it never works again. All right, I'm going to start partway down because I need the whole screen for this. So we have KEQ 0.587. We have to get the products of all of those um, concentrations raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. So the first one was C sub C. So C sub C is equal to C A naught. Um, the theta for that one is 0 because we didn't start off with any C. But the stoichiometric coefficient for C was 2. So we have 2x divided by 1 plus 2x. And that entire quantity is squared. That whole concentration is squared. We also have a C sub B. C sub B is going to be equal to C A naught. Again, the theta for that one was 0. We didn't start off with any um, b. Its stoichiometric coefficient is 1, so we have an x divided by 1 plus 2x. So I'll just highlight each one of these. This term was c sub c. This term is c sub b. And now we need a c sub a. Um, c sub a is inverted, but just so that the cancellations in the next step look a little bit more obvious. That would appear to be this. So theta A, remember, is always 1. Uh, and then we just flip it all because C sub A is on the bottom. So the 1 plus 2x goes up top, and the 1 minus x goes on the bottom. There is one more term that sits out front, or sorry, at the end, which is RT squared. I did not practice that, but we got lucky that it fit on one screen. So we have C sub A there. We have all of that information too, right? We know the temperature. We obviously know gas. Um, our CA naught, how would we determine what CA naught is? It's um, 
not giving any better volume, but we know that we start off with nothing but CA naught. Mm -hmm. So we start off with nothing but CA or nothing but A. So if we have something like this and we wanted to find CA naught, CA naught is equal to PA naught over RT. PA naught is equal to YA naught times P over RT. So we can solve for that directly if we need to. This is actually where you can, sometimes choosing a basis will lead you down the wrong route. Um, if you're not quite sure whether or not you can solve for that, you should try first. Uh, if you were to have chosen a basis, you may end up with the wrong value for CA naught. How do I know that? Because the first time I worked this problem, I chose a basis just like that. Uh, and I kept getting the wrong answer every time. Which is, you know, usually the case when you set 2 equal to 1. So if we do a little bit of simplification here, and since we've got colors, we'll take care of colors. Uh, this CA naught is going to cancel this CA naught. Uh, this 1 plus 2x cancels this 1 plus 2x. And that's about it. But it does simplify a little bit. 0 0.587. So we're going to have 2x. The quantity 2x squared is 4x squared times an x. So we're going to have a 4x cubed on top. Uh, and then we're going to have one of our 1 plus 2 x's left on the bottom. Then we have the following term, which is CA naught RT squared. That is not a coincidence that we got that. What, is, what are the units of that CA naught RT term? Uh, it'll be, is it inverse pressure? What are the units according to that top left equation? Uh, bar. bar. The term on the inside is bar, right? If I square it, then I get bar squared. Yeah. What is the one minus x term? Oh, yeah, there's a 1 minus x in the bottom. Thank you. Hang on just a second. I know you guys hate it when I do that. I'm sorry. I just keep doing it. So we forgot the 1 minus x term over here at the end. Should a 1 plus 2x be squared? Yes. So this term over here on the right, CA not R squared, is always going to have units of bar on it. I've got to reset my. So that will indicate to you what the units are that you need to use for R, right? T is almost always going to be in Kelvin. We never do anything but Kelvin. Um, and then your units on R will depend on whatever your units of CA naught are. Um, if CA naught is in moles per liter, you're going to have to choose the appropriate R that has units of moles and liters and bars inside of it. But we can also simplify that a little bit because we know that CA naught times RT happens to be equal to YA naught times P. And we know that YA naught is 1 for this problem, so this is just equal to P. So we have this expression for X over here is equal to all of this either CA naught RT squared or p squared. Either one is fine. In fact, you have to end up getting the same number because we're just using the ideal gas law to get there. And I'm going to try to shift this back without screwing everything up. Oh, yeah. There we go. So we could solve this in either direction. It's probably easier to just use p. Um, rather than trying to calculate CA naught times RT 
because we happen to know that p is just 3 bar. Right? We can save ourselves a little bit of effort um, and just plug in 3 squared rather than calculating ca not rt because um, you're going to end up getting 3. So we do have, uh, it's a fairly ugly looking expression. Thank you for the people who corrected my algebra. It's fairly ugly looking, but it's straightforward in the sense that it's one equation, it's got one variable. Um, we do know how to solve that if we have like a computer or a calculator sitting in front of us. I'm not aware of any simple way to come up with an analytic expression for that. Um, so I dumped it into my calculator. If you have a TI-89, um, they have a nice solve feature in there, which you can dump this in there and have an answer for it fairly quickly. If you're using uh, MATLAB, you can use something like the Symbolic Algebra Toolbox, um, and it'll solve that. Or if you like F0, F0 can solve that. Um, or Wolfram Alpha or Excel, um, almost anything can do it. What would yeah. something like this look like on an exam? Would you give us something that could be done by hand really easily? Yeah, if I give you something on an exam, it'll probably look like x1 minus x. Right, something that you can shift it around. Um, most of the equations that you'll see on the exam are something like A goes to B, um, so that you get nice stuff like this. Or I can give you something nasty like this and tell you set up but do not solve an equation for X. So if I do end up solving that, I get the following, which is X at equilibrium. Uh, is equal to 0 0.309. I solved that with my calculator. But now we can check. So how do we check? The first thing that we can check is just put that x back in there and make sure that we got the same number, uh, except this time we can use the ca not rt um, and our stoichiometric tables. So we know that CA naught is equal to the partial pressure of A initially over RT, which is 0 0.0301 moles per liter. Sometimes if you're going to do these kinds of checks, you do need to carry around a fair number of digits um, just to make sure that the numbers come out OK. And then we can calculate our final concentrations of everything. So C sub A, remember we said was CA naught times 1 minus x divided by 1 plus 2x. And if you do that math, you get 0 0.0129 moles per liter. I'm not going to write that equation for the other ones, but I will write the numbers that you get. So you, if you write the equivalent ones for each one of these, CB is not very big, 0058. Uh, and C sub C is 0 0.0115. And now I can check my calculation of KEQ because KEQ is supposed to be equal to Kc times Rt to the delta, which is equal to C sub C squared C sub B over C sub A times Rt squared. And so what are the units that we need for R here, roughly speaking? What are the units on that? Are those the same units of volume that we've got here for CA? One cubic centimeter is the same as a liter. One cubic centimeter is a liter? A thousand cubic centimeters. Right, so there's going to be a unit conversion in there somewhere. So generally, you need units of moles, liters, bars, and Kelvin. <coughs> However you choose to get those, whether you look it up in a table or you start with 8.314, uh, meters pascals per mole Kelvin um, and do the unit conversions. I, it 
you'll always end up with the same R, but whatever the units are on R have to be consistent with the other units that you've chosen in the problem. The units of pressure are easy because those are always going to be bar, but keep track of what your units of concentration are and make sure that your R has the same units of concentration, um, whether it's moles per liter or moles per cubic centimeter or whatever it is, um, make sure you use the right value of R. If you don't, um, then this equality will not work because we saw from Ke calc that this is supposed to be 0 0.5A6 um, and if we plug this in we get 0 0.592 which is pretty close that's less than a 1% difference actually if that's not a type no yeah less than 1% difference which is about as close as we're going to be able to get if you carried along more and more digits of that this would look closer and closer to the original value it would never be able to approach any closer than however you solved for x, right? x was solved for in an iterative loop, um, which had some sort of precision set on it, maybe like one part in a million. Uh, so we wouldn't expect this to agree any better than one part in a million. 1% is pretty good. So that's good. This worked out. There is yet another way that we could do this. Right? Instead of using the giant C equation, equation um, instead of this equation of C, we could do what I said down here, which is to calculate the moles over the moles total and use that directly for Y. I'm not going to repeat that entire um, calculation for it, but we can at least check that that should still be the same because we can quickly calculate the total number of moles as the sum of all of the moles of each component. And we end up with 0 0.0301. That is a coincidence that that happens to be the same, even though delta is different. And then we can calculate our y's, which I'll add in blue here. y sub a is c sub a over c sub t. And similarly, y sub b uh, is equal to C sub B over C sub T and Y sub C uh, is going to be equal to something. You know what it equals. I can't. Oh, yes, I can. There we go. Oh, we got a weird mark on there. C sub C over C sub T. Right, if I calculate each one of those, then I can dump that into our expression for K. Sorry, let me leave that up there. Does everybody have this Y? Yell at me if I go to the next page and you don't have them. If we just deal with the Ys, then we get YA is 0 0.429. Y sub B is 0 0.193, and Y C is equal to 0 0.386. Remember our KP, which should be equal to KEQ, is going to be Y C squared Y B over Y A times P squared. What are the units of P here? Always bar. And if we do that, then sure enough, we will get K sub P uh, is a little bit further off, which is 0 0.603. Um, this one is about 3% off. But again, if you, instead of carrying three digits, if you carry six digits, that's going to end up looking really, really close to what we saw before. So we only solved it using C, right? We used the big expression for C. Um, but this should be evidence that no matter how you solve it, you can always use the other version to check your answer, um, which also means that you can use either version to solve it. You can either use the Ys, um, which will require an expression using the terms we have for N, for the moles of each component, or you can solve for um, the KCs using that big expression we have for C. The only way you're guaranteed to get the same number each time is if you use that full expression for C that includes the whatever that is on the bottom, 1 plus Y A naught delta times X. But you should get the same answer either time. 
So that's also something that you can do to check your answers on the homeworks. So you can use either one of these methods, calculate the other material, other quantities, and then check it. But you should get the same answer. I don't know how many times I've said that. Too many. Any questions on any steps that we took along the way? Yeah? If we don't have an isothermal process, uh, we, how would we use KT as KC times RT raised to the delta? You would still use that, except now you're going to have to solve a differential equation. Okay. Um, because as the system reacts, the temperature is going to change, and we need a way to take care of that. And that's actually what we're going to start on Monday with. Any other questions? This is the same procedure you can use for those last two homework problems. If, if you haven't started the homework problems, you can use that procedure on all of them because it always works. All right, last thing I want to bring up is just a general discussion of what does K tell us. Generally speaking, KEQ uh, is interpreted as the concentration of our products over the concentration of our reactants. Whether you're dealing with I's or C's, or sorry, Y's or C's or X's or whatever it is, generally it looks like concentration of products over concentrations of reactants. The very first thing that this tells us, that KEQ tells us, is that the concentration of products uh, is going to be related to the concentration of reactants times whatever KEQ is. That glorious revelation has a particular name. Is it, has anybody seen that name before for that, something like that concept? Sometimes it, they use a, like a teeter-totter or a seesaw to say, well, if I increase the amount of reactants, I have to decrease something else. Yeah, something like that. Um, Le Chatelier's principle is sometimes expressed in this way. If I dump in more reactants, I will also get more products coming out. There's not, that, that shouldn't be a surprise, right? If I increase the concentration of reactants, there's more stuff there, and therefore I will increase the concentration of products. There's another relationship that we have, which was that the change in KEQ with temperature is equal to the enthalpy divided by RT, enthalpy of reaction divided by RT. This tells us how KEQ will change with temperature, and we can use that with the expression on top to figure out what happens to our products and our reactants. If, for example, we have an exothermic reaction, for an exothermic reaction, delta H is going to be less than zero. And if delta H is less than zero, then K, with respect to temperature, is also going to be less than zero. So the slope of DLN of K versus temperature is going to be less than zero. What that means is that if you take temperature and you increase it, that's going to have the effect of decreasing KEQ. That comes from the Van Hoff expression that we've got there. If we increase the temperature for an exothermic reaction, KEQ is going to go down. And this is generally going to favor the reactants. You're not going to get as much conversion as you would have if you had dropped the temperature, which is a little bit maybe counterintuitive, right? Usually we think if we heat things up, things will react more. They will react faster. So the way that we saw the Arrhenius expression for the rate constant K, that one always goes up if temperature goes up, which means you will get to equilibrium faster. But where equilibrium is, is dictated by the KEQ value, and the Van Hoff expression explains how KEQ varies with temperature. Since most reactions are exothermic, we're usually in this world where we're trying to balance the two. Right? The rate will go faster if we increase the temperature, but if we increase the temperature, we're also going to push KEQ down, which is going to end up resulting in a smaller equilibrium conversion. 
So it's a balancing act of how long do I want to wait and how much product do I want to make. They usually don't go hand in hand. If it's an endothermic reaction, then sometimes you can get away with it. Because for an endothermic reaction, the sign of the slope is switched because delta A is switched, and now increasing T also increases KEQ, which will favor your products. And then the third point that we have, which is one that we just came up with, however KEQ goes is the same way that KP goes. Uh, and KP looks something like K with a bunch of Ys times P to the delta. So this term can tell us what to expect from pressure. But it's not always the same, right? Because for different reactions, you will have different deltas. So we have three cases for this. So 3A, the easiest one. Oh, sorry. So the squiggles here just mean scales as, right? It doesn't mean that they're equal to, it just means if one goes up, the other goes up as well. Or if one goes down, the other goes down as well. So if we have, I'm gonna go again, because we only have three minutes. If we have delta is equal to zero, then pressure has no effect on KEQ. at least not for um, the expressions as we, as we have written them. Uh, as we'll see when we get to reactors, pressure can still have an effect uh, because it comes in, in other places. But at least on KEQ, pressure would have no effect if delta is equal to zero. And then the other two options should be, at least what those options are should be obvious. One of them is if delta is greater than zero the other one is what happens if delta is less than zero. If delta is greater than zero, then as the pressure goes up, the quantity of KEQ over P delta is going to go down. So you're going to push that quantity. Why am I writing it KEQ over P delta? Because I'm interested in those concentration terms. What's happening to the concentration terms? The concentration terms for something like KP are coming from KY. Right, so what I want to know is KEQ over P delta is going to look like KY, which is my ratio of concentration. So that overall term will go down. And in general, if that's going down, it's going to favor the reactants. But depending on the expression, uh, delta could go the other way, and now you get the reverse, which is that this quantity KEQ over P delta is going to follow along, uh, and therefore this is going to favor the products. So the effect of pressure is a little bit more subtle because it depends on what the value of delta is. It also requires you to usually write down whatever KEQ is is equal to KY times P to the delta and rearrange it so that you can see this concentration over concentration term, the products over the reactants, and figure out what effect pressure is having in there. But they're, they're good general trends when you're trying to figure out, should I increase or decrease the temperature of my, my reactor and should I increase or decrease the pressure of my reactor? As we're going to see next week, we usually just solve the thing rather than try to guess what's going to happen until we get some intuition. So that's all I've got. Enjoy your weekend. Weekend. I will see you back here on Monday. Don't forget the exam is on Friday. <laughs>